I am excited about our Bible class this morning. We were so blessed this past Sunday morning. The presence of God was here so real. And I heard a, uh, uh, I believe it was Brother Larry Booker made the statement one time that there are two subjects that God will always anoint every time they're preached or taught, and that is the doctrine of the oneness of God and the message of holiness and separation from the world. And there is a special anointing that comes with these subjects. And the reason why we can feel that is because God, God likes it. God especially likes it. And, and, and I love to study the word of God when we can feel that divine validation from heaven of the doctrine that we're talking about. And last week we began a comparison between the oneness view of the Godhead and the Trinitarian view of the Godhead. And we're going to continue uh, on that subject this morning. Now, we, we will run into people from time to time that says, hey, you know, I know there's different ideas about God and oneness and Trinity and, and is God three persons or is it three manifestations? But I have people tell me from time to time, you know, Pastor, really it's all, we're all saying the same thing. We're just using different words to say it. And at the end of the day, we all believe the same thing. Uh, we just take a little different approach to get there. Well, I understand where people are coming from when they say that, but I have to respectfully disagree. And, and I have to assert that it's very important for us to study this subject because there is nothing more foundational in our walk with God than knowing who God is. And it's, it's kind of like if I'm going to get to know you as a person, one of the first things I need to do is to get to know what your name is. If I meet you and your name is Bob and, and, and someone has told me back along the line that your name is Jim, I might, you might be too polite to say anything every time I refer to you as Jim. And, uh, I can be talking to you. We might go a lot of places, do a lot of things together. But if I constantly refer to you by the wrong name, it's going to make it a little bit awkward. You're going to feel a slight level of disrespect. You'll think, man, he's not even making the effort to know what my real name is. And I may not mean anything malicious by the fact that I'm calling you by the wrong name, but it would still be uh, just good and appropriate to take the time to know uh, what your name is and who you are and, and something about you. And when it comes to serving this great God that we all love so much and, and, and has done so much for us, there's, I can't think of anything that's more beneficial or valuable in our study of the scripture than to search out who he is and what he's like and learn everything we can about him. So, uh, with that in mind, we're going to once again do a quick comparison between the two major views of the Godhead. First of all, there is the doctrine of the Trinity. Uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, these are not my words on the screen. This is uh, the words of Trinitarian theologians who have explained it for us. They say the doctrine of the Trinity defines God as three divine persons, the Father, the Son, Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. The three persons are distinct, yet coexist in unity and are co-equal, co-eternal, and co-substantial. The Trinity is considered to be a mystery of the Christian faith. And by that, those who uh, are scholars of the Trinitarian persuasion will just tell you there's no way you'll ever be able to understand the Trinity because it's too uh, obscure and the way it all works together is beyond any human comprehension. That's what they say. It is a mystery. 
And so we have a large branch or swath of, of Christians that when they think of God, they think of God as three different distinct co-equal, co-eternal persons. We have God the Father. If you see him draw it out in the picture, they'll, you'll have a throne with God the Father sitting on the throne. He's usually depicted in a like a long curly beard. And uh, oftentimes he's holding a staff like he needs help walking. Uh, and then, then beside God the Father in the artwork, you'll see a picture of a young man standing there, which is God the Son. And then oftentimes in their artwork, you'll have a dove that's flying in circles around both of their heads or hovering over them. And that's the artist's uh, rendition of, of, of the Trinity. And that lends the concept that instead of God being one individual, he's more like a corporation. Those who believe in the Trinity will quickly tell you, we believe in one God. But when you press them on the point, they don't believe God is one as in the sense of one person, but uh, one as in the sense of when you join together with different business partners, you have several different partners, but you can make one corporation. And so the Trinitarian idea of God is more of a corporate oneness than an individual oneness. But on the other hand, there is the view of the Godhead called the oneness view. The doctrine of oneness defines God as one eternal being who manifests himself in various ways to humanity. And the oneness view believes that the scriptural references to the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit to be descriptive of different manifestations of the one person, that one being, who is God. And so we don't deny the Father. We believe in the Son, and we believe in the Holy Spirit. We believe in all those things, but we believe that those are just different titles that describe different uh, roles of one God, one individual. Much like, uh, as, as I'm here, I have a name. My name is Caleb Adams, but there are many different titles that describe, uh, who I am and different roles that I feel. I have a child, so Caleb Adams is a father, but I have a, uh, I have parents, so I'm also a son. And when I interact with my parents, my relationship with them is a little different than my relationship with my daughter. There are times I speak and act as a son, and there are times I speak and act as a father, but I'm a married man, so I'm also a husband. And so we have son, father, husband. I pastor this church, and the way I interact with this church is a little differently than the way I interact with my parents or my wife. And so the word pastor once again describes a different role that I fill. So here I am with one name. And I'm one individual, but I've got all of these different titles that describe different aspects of my relationship with different people. And, and that is somewhat of comparison of, of the Godhead. The name of God is Jesus Christ. And, and when we read of Jesus Christ and, and the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, we need to think of those as titles that describe different manifestations of the one God. And so when we read through the Bible, it helps to understand that. But I want to talk for just a few minutes here about a few aids to understanding the Godhead in the Scripture. The first thing uh, that we need to understand about Jesus is that Jesus was both God and man and thus he had a dual nature. Now, at his incarnation, at Mary's, uh, in Mary's womb at Bethlehem, the great God of glory stepped down out of the corridors of heaven and the spirit God, uh, the creator God, he took upon himself the likeness of man. 
And when God assumed human nature there in Bethlehem, when he was born and laid in a manger, God was taking on human nature. And he assumed something that he did not have before, yet but at the same time that he assumed humanity, he did not cease to be God. So he took on man and an assumed human nature, but he continued to be what he always was, which was Jehovah God. And so when we read and see Jesus in the Bible, Jesus as the Son of God specifically is talking about the flesh, that tangible substance of the baby in the manger, the man that walked the seas of Galilee and 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 the man that hung on the cross, the flesh, that was the Son of God. But inside the flesh, the eternal spirit of Jehovah lived and indwelt in the flesh. Jesus was both God and man. And so when you read the Bible, and particularly the four Gospels, every time you see Jesus doing something or saying something, you need to keep in mind this simple thought. Is Jesus, in this particular example, acting as a man, or is he acting as God? Is he speaking as man, or is he speaking of God? Because see, he was both God and man. In him we have the two natures, the nature of deity, and the nature of humanity, and in him, deity and humanity were fused, but they were not confused. Two distinct natures in Jesus. So that means that Jesus could speak and act from two different standpoints, both as a man and as Almighty God. For example... When Jesus was walking on the sea of Galilee, he was doing so as God. Man can't walk on water in and of himself. So we see him walking on the sea and he's walking as God. But later on when we see him walking beside the sea, he's walking as a man. When Jesus slept in the bottom of the boat during the storm, he was sleeping as a man because God doesn't sleep. The humanity was asleep. But when Jesus, a few moments later, stood up in the boat and he looked out there at the wind and the waves and he said, peace, be still. He wasn't speaking as a man. He was speaking as God because the winds and the waves obeyed his command. So he was both God and man. In John chapter 11, when he walked up to the tomb of Lazarus and stood there with all of the mourners and the family who had just been bereaved of a brother, the Bible said that Jesus wept. And when Jesus wept and the tears were streaming down his dusty cheeks, he was weeping as a man. He could feel the loss and He could feel the sense of grief that the family felt. But just a few moments later, he looked into the cavern of that tomb and he spoke two simple or three simple words. He said, Lazarus, come forth. And when he did so, he that was dead came forth. Now, when he said that, he was speaking as God Because a man cannot raise the dead with his mere words. But Jesus was more than a man. And his words were more than just human utterance at times. He spoke with the voice of Almighty God. So in him he is both deity and humanity. He is God and he is man. We have in him the two complete perfect natures They were fused together, but they were not confused. 
when he sat down on the side of the well in John chapter 4 and spoke to the Samaritan woman, he sat there because he was tired. Jesus got tired in the heat of the day, just like you do. He sweated. He got thirsty, just like you do. But the Bible says that the everlasting God, the creator, faints not, nor is he weary. So when you read of Jesus being weary, we're reading of his humanity. But when we read about the miracles, we're reading about deity. And so anytime you're reading through the Bible and we talk about we're reading of Jesus doing or saying something, you've got to ask yourself the question, is he speaking from his human standpoint or from the divine standpoint? And when you uh, have that understanding and take it from there, a lot of passages of Scripture that used to not make sense will now start coming together and unfolding and making sense. Another aid to understanding is to keep in mind there are scriptures that use plural references pertaining to Jesus and God. But these plural references are not speaking about different persons. They're speaking about different roles, manifestations, modes of activity or relationships as pertaining to God's self-revelation. And we might talk about this more next week. We'll see how it goes, but... Uh, some scripture says unto God the Father and to Jesus Christ and the Savior. And we've got all these different titles and names and, and we, and, and some have looked at those scriptures and say, well, they're God the Father and God, uh, and Jesus Christ and the Savior. So we've got different persons here. No, we're not reading of different persons. We're just reading of different roles or aspects of the one and same person. And another thing, to keep in mind when you read through the scripture is that the New Testament writers had no concept of a trinity. They were Jewish people for the most part. And and Jewish people are strict monotheists. They believe in just one God. And for them, the idea that God is three persons was a foreign concept. It was not till later on that the Catholic Church brought in the doctrine, and actually they they manufactured it. It's well documented in history. The Catholic Church is the one that came up with the idea that God existed as a trinity of three persons. In fact, when you read through the Bible, not one time in the Bible is the word trinity ever found. It's not there. The, The idea and the concept of trinity wasn't there. But as the Catholic Church gave birth to the concept of God is a trinity. They formed all kinds of language and thought process, and they were very much able to shape the way people thought about God. And and when Martin Luther brought the Protestant Reformation in the 16th century, and he made stands that a lot of what Luther did was right, and he came away from a lot of the false teachings and ideas of the Catholic Church. However, Luther should have abandoned more of their teachings than just the ones that he did. He should have abandoned the idea of a trinity and embraced the biblical idea of the oneness of God. So what we have is a lot of times people have been raised up in church, and, and, and what I'm teaching this morning, they've never heard of this such stuff. Do you believe in the Trinity? Well, of course I believe in the Trinity. Doesn't everybody? And so when they read scriptures that talk about the Son and the Father, because of the way they were raised and the way their thoughts were shaped, immediately they see two different individuals when when the correct view would have been to see different aspects of the one eternal God. So, We're going to look at a few passages of Scripture again this morning that a lot of people have looked at years past, and they they say that Scripture proves that there are multiple persons in the Godhead. Well, let's look at a few. First of all is the prayers of Christ. I'm I'm just giving one Scripture where Jesus prayed, but there are many, many Scriptures here. John 17 and 1. These words spake Jesus and lifted up 
his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hours come, glorify thy son, that thy son may also glorify thee. So here we have the man, the son, standing on earth, lifting his eyes up to heaven and speaking to, to the father, which apparently was in heaven. And the Trinitarians say that this verse and the many other verses like it prove to us that the Son was a separate person from the Father. They believe that these passages actually show one divine person in the Godhead praying to another divine person in the Godhead. After all, we've got the Son on earth lifting up his eyes, praying to the Father in heaven, and asking the Father to glorify the Son. Now, How in the world can you see one person there when it seems to be that one person's praying to another? Well, the question that I want to answer here is do the prayers of Christ really prove multiple persons in the Godhead, or do they prove the dual nature of Jesus Christ, that he was both human and divine? Because keep in mind, last week I told you how that God fills all of creation. He's omnipresent. You know what that means? That means God's everywhere at the same time. Now, we're on planet Earth right now, and we're in the presence of God. But did you know that if it were possible for one of us to step into a space shuttle and land on the moon between now and next week, we could still feel God's presence there? Do you believe that? Do you believe it's possible for the astronauts in the space station right now to be able to pray and feel God's presence? Of course we do. So the reason that God could be up there and down here is because we know the Bible teaches he's everywhere. And so when God stepped down into the realm of mankind and he took on himself the garment of flesh, he assumed what he had never had before. But even though he assumed what he before was not, he never stopped being what he always was. And so while we can have the son, the flesh on earth, Speaking to the Father, the eternal God, and looking up to heaven, just because the Father was in heaven, does not mean that he wasn't also at the same time in earth. And when we read of many other scriptures, we find out that the Father was also in the Son. Give that a minute just to sink in here. So, when we see Jesus praying, the question is, who's he prayed to? Who did he pray to? Was it one divine person in the Godhead praying to another divine person? Or do the prayers of Jesus show his humanity? That flesh part of him praying to the deity that indwelt him. That's exactly what the prayers of Christ was. Well, some people say, well, Brother Adams, that's not right because if that were the case, then that means that Jesus prayed to himself. No, it doesn't mean that because it might mean that in the case of you or I, but keep in mind that even though Jesus was a man, he was different than any other man because in him, he had a complete human will just like ours, and with the exception that it was not sinful. He was without sin. But Jesus also had a divine will. There was the perfect nature of God, two perfect and complete natures, humanity and deity. And so it might sound strange if we talked about such things right here. 
if it were pertaining to you and I, but it's not strange or absurd when we talk about Jesus. When we see Jesus praying to himself, or we, he doesn't pray to himself because that would imply that he just had one nature, a human nature. But when Jesus is praying, always understand it was the nature of his humanity. It was the, the man, the human, the part that only walked beside the sea that was praying to Deity, the part that would enable him to walk on the sea. The flesh was praying to the spirit when Jesus prayed. But why did Jesus pray? Well, Jesus prayed for two reasons. First of all, he prayed because he was truly human and he had to pray. The Bible said in Psalms that all flesh shall come unto thee and every Human being needs God. And Jesus in his humanity needed the enablement of the Spirit. But there's another reason why he prayed. Second reason is he prayed to set an example for us to follow. 1 Peter 2 and 21 says, For hereunto were ye called, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we should follow in his steps. And so as Jesus, not only was he our savior, but he was our example. If you want to know how to treat people, how to love people, how to act upstanding, how to be a Christian, you know what you got to do? You got to go to the Bible, get in those gospels and the epistles, and find out what did Jesus do. Remember the movement back in the 90s? They had the bracelets, WWJD. What what would Jesus do? And it was based, based off this concept that he was our example. Now, if Jesus had never prayed, if we had no record of him praying, then it would lend itself to his followers in the church today living a prayerless life. We could rightfully say if he had never prayed, then I don't need to pray either because I'm just trying to be like him. But the fact that he did pray and pray often set a pattern for us who follow in his steps that we also need to pray. So Jesus prayed because the humanity, the flesh, needed the enablement of the spirit, but he also was praying for for an example for us. Now, back to the Trinitarian uh, interpretation of these scriptures here. The Trinitarians have three people in the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. In their words, they are co-equal, co-existent, co-eternal. Got Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And, and according to them, all of these are completely God. Not one's not above the other. And so, okay, that sounds fine for them to believe that. And, and they would say to us, they would say, look at their scripture show Jesus praying to the Father. So that's got to prove our theology is correct in that they're separate persons. Well, okay, but let's just Let's just take that a step further. If a person holds the Trinitarian idea of God, you run into a major problem when you get to the prayers of Christ. Because to believe the Trinity is you got to believe that they are co-equal. And if they are co-equal, the first problem is this. Is if Jesus prayed to a second divine person in the Godhead, then he could not have been truly God because he would have had to be subordinate to the first person. And that would be contrary to the Trinitarian doctrine of co-equality. Let me tell you something, brothers and sisters. God is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-my-present. He doesn't have to counsel with anybody. He doesn't have to get permission from anybody. 
And he sure don't need help from anybody. And so how can we have two all-powerful, all-knowing, all-night-present persons in the Godhead, but yet one person who is co-equal to the first person somehow can't get by without the help and the support of the first person? That dog won't hunt. Now, keep in mind the doctrine of Trinity said that three people in the God is one God, but that one God is, is, is the, the three joined together. I've heard him, I've heard him explain the Trinity like a choo-choo train. Engine, box car, and caboose. One train, three cars all linked together. That works when we're talking about choo-choo trains, but we're talking about God, not trains. <laughs> Another problem with the interpretation is this. Is that every time Jesus prayed, he directed his prayers to the Father with no mention of the Holy Spirit. Question I have, if the idea of Trinity is true. Why would Jesus steadfastly ignore the third person in the Trinity? Now think about it. If you were that third person in the Trinity and you were supposed to be co-equal to the other two, but every time the son had to pray, he wouldn't say a word to you. He only prayed to the father. I mean, if I were the Holy Spirit, I'd be flapping my little wing and say, hey, well, I'm over here too. I'm important too. Talk to me too. But Jesus never prayed to the Holy Spirit. He prayed to the father. Explain that. How do we fit that in with the idea of co-equality? And so just using logic along with the scripture, the idea of God being three, it just doesn't wash out. But the oneness of God, when you understand that the Son referred just to the flesh, but the flesh could not completely be God apart from the spirit. And we understand that the flesh in its humanity needed the enablement of deity. And every time we see the flesh praying to the spirit, the son praying to the father, we understand that this is not speaking of different persons, but it's rather one part of God or his his flesh praying to deity because in him two natures were fused but they were not confused everybody still with me now I've got 10 minutes to preach 50 minutes worth of lesson left so I'm going to have to talk real fast this next part another scripture that many say proves of multiple persons in Godhead is the right hand of God. Acts chapter 7. This is Stephen. He's getting stoned to death because of preaching. And the Bible said he, speaking of Stephen, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and he saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And Stephen said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Now, those who hold the idea of Trinity say, Well, looky there. This scriptures and many other scriptures that talk about the right hand of God prove that there's different persons in the Godhead. Because here is what they say. They say that here we got God sitting on his throne and we've got the son standing beside him 
And, and that right there proves that they can't be the same person because after all, we've got two in that scripture, right? And is there two beings here? See, the glory of God, Jesus staying on the right hand of God, okay? We're going to take a closer look at that. Question is, is this what Stephen saw? God, the old man, the father, sitting on the throne and the son standing at his right hand. That's how many visualize this scripture. However, I would propose that when we read of the son standing on the right hand, that was never meant to be interpreted physically. Rather, it is interpreted symbolically. The first reason I believe that this is symbolic language is this. As the Bible says, no one has seen God at any time, neither can a human see him. That means that God in his spirit form cannot be seen by human eyes. The only way we can say that we have seen God is if God chooses to reveal himself through what we call a manifestation. He's got to take on something that he is not to declare what he is. Another reason why we do not believe that Stephen's incident here declares two persons up there is this. If Stephen saw two persons, why would he ignore one of them and pray only to Jesus? Think about it. Here he is. He's fixing to die and the heavens open. He sees the glory of God and the sun standing on the right hand. So if the concept of the old man on the throne is right and the sun standing behind him, why wouldn't you go right to the one on the throne? Well, one simple explanation is Stephen didn't see two people up there. Another problem is if he saw separate physical manifestations of the Father and Son, where was the Holy Ghost? I mean, when you read through the Bible, the Holy Ghost absolutely gets neglected. I mean, it talks about the Father and the Son, the Father and the Son, the Son and the Father. And every now and then we get a little side mention of the Holy Spirit. Now, if I were the Holy Spirit and I was co-equal, the rest, I would be mighty offended. I'd be fluttering my wings demanding that I get my just due. So, let's look at it again. He being full of the Holy Ghost looked up steadfastly in the heaven and saw what? He saw God the Father. He saw the Spirit of God. What does the Bible say? He saw the glory of God. And Jesus standing on the right hand. And then he said, Behold, I see the Heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. I want you to notice the only person that Stephen said he saw was Jesus. Amen. He did not say he's seen any other person in this passage other than Jesus. Now, so the right hand of God, is that talking about a physical thing or is it a metaphor to explain something else. If we believe the right hand of God must be taken in a physical sense, then we've got to ask this question. Acts 2 and 34 said that Jesus is sitting on the right hand of God, but Stephen said he's standing. So what was he doing? Is he sitting or standing? Because the Bible says both. So the Bible said... He's standing on the right hand of God. 
So if you interpret that to physically be describing a physical situation, let me ask you this. Is Jesus standing on top of the Father's right hand like this? I was going to illustrate that and sit my hand on this platform and have one of you men come stand on my hand. One says absurd. What is it? Some people insist this scripture is a physical situation. So if you're going to physically interpret it, is he standing on the hand or is he next to the hand? Which is it? When you go through the Bible, you find that many times the right hand of God is used in a symbolic nature. For example, Psalm 16 and 8, David wrote, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. So when David said the Lord is on my right hand, does that mean he could only touch God when he reached that way, but he could not touch God when he reached to the left? And if God's on the right hand physically to the people of God, Where does that leave all of us lefties? He said he's always at my right hand. So that means that the left hand of people are in trouble. If the right hand of God is physical. Psalm 77, 10. David said, I will remember the years of the right hand of the most high. So was he only promising to remember the years when God had a right hand? Was there a time when his right hand was amputated and he did not have a right hand? Psalm 98 1 declares of the Lord his right hand and his holy arm hath gotten him the victory. Does this mean that God defeated his enemies by holding back his left hand and crushing them with a physical right hand? Obviously not. The Bible said in Psalm 109, 31, that the Lord shall stand on the right hand of the poor. Does he physically station himself next to poor people all the time? Isaiah 48 and 13, my right hand has spanned the heavens. Did God physically reach out a giant hand and cover the sky? Or was this speaking metaphorically of how he created? Get this one. Luke 11 and 20, Jesus said, if I with the finger of God cast out devils, did Jesus pull down a big finger? out of the sky and punch the devil out of people? Obviously, the answer to all of these is no. These were not physical, meant to be taken physical, but the right hand is speaking metaphorically. It's in a symbolic or poetic sense. What does the right hand of God mean? In the Bible, the right hand of God signifies strength, power, and preeminence. So, when you say, I would um, give my right arm to do, be able to do this. What you're saying is if I give my right arm, it's really, really important to me. There are some times we may say of a co-worker or an employee, this person is my right-hand man. How many of y'all have ever said that? He's my right-hand man. Well, the right-hand man does not mean that that employee always walks to your right and never stands on the left side. 
What you're saying is this employee has got a position of, of usefulness and value and power and importance. And, and really he is a preeminent person to to our job and to what we're doing right here and so when you read in the word of God of Jesus standing on the right hand of God it's not talking about a physical situation in which you've got one person in the Godhead standing next to the other person of the Godhead but Jesus being at the right hand of God says that Jesus occupies a position of power preeminence and usefulness in the economy of God that no other being feels. The Bible says in Acts 5 and 31 that him hath God exalted with his right hand to be a prince and a savior. So when the Bible speaks of Jesus being on the right hand of God, it is saying that Jesus is the saving power of God. So in summary, the right hand of God, rather than proving a trinity, actually reveals the omnipotence and the absolute deity of Jesus. And it vindicates the message of the one God in Christ. So we return to our original question in closing. What did Stephen actually see? Well... It's apparent that he saw Jesus, but he saw, he said, I saw the glory of God and the son of man standing on his right hand or the son of man was standing there in the position of power and preeminence. Okay. So what he saw was a fulfillment of Isaiah 40 and 5. And it said, then the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and all flesh shall see it together. So when Stephen looked up into heaven, you know what he saw? He saw Jesus standing there and his face was radiating with the glory of the one and only true God. Stephen did not see a trinity or a duality, he saw Jesus beaming with the glory of God. And that's why when he was dying, he looked up again and he said, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Because all he was seeing was Jesus shining with the glory of God. Don't you love the truth of God's word? Yeah. Hallelujah. Do you know that when you pray in the name of Jesus, all the power of heaven is at your disposal. When you call on that name, you are invoking the name of the great God of glory. Let's clap our hands and magnify the name of Jesus together.